Hello and welcome. The baptism of Jesus. The reading is from John chapter 1 beginning at verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and John declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The baptism of Jesus is a, is a curious event. It certainly confused the prophet John the Baptist. And it confuses many of us because like John, we share his first instinct. Surely Jesus shouldn't need to do this. You remember the context. John had set himself up as a new prophet that hadn't been one since Malachi. And he called all the people out of Jerusalem and he invited them to repent, to cleanse themselves. The great project of what we call the Old or the First Testament was this sanctification of Israel, the making holy of a people. And within the life of the people, the whole of the law was designed to distinguish between holiness and unholiness so that God could purify his people, his people could reflect him. The way they lived would resonate with him. And so there was a great distinction between holiness and, and unholiness. And John said to the people, you have become unholy, you must change and repent. And this touched a very profound nerve in a way that I think should surprise us. And even the Pharisees who were, who were a meticulous renewal movement, even they came and repented. And then to our great surprise comes Jesus, and to John's surprise too. And John says to Jesus, you shouldn't be here. And Jesus says, let it be so, and, and is baptised. Now, why and how does that affect us? It affects us because we begin a relationship with Jesus that is so much deeper than the picture of Jesus that many people have. There is a, a constant heresy, which is that, that Jesus is a, a holy example. He's someone we should follow in the sense of copying his example. But actually, of course, this is completely impossible because we can't do what Jesus did. We can't be who Jesus was. Jesus for us is something much more than an example. He is someone whom we become or who becomes in us. There's a profound intermingling between who he is and who we are and it's an intermingling that he initiates and that he carries out. And that's partly what his baptism means because we are invited always to repent and to be purified and to draw closer to God. But one of the things that happens as we grow in self-knowledge is we discover we can't. Something stops us. We have a divided self. Part of us wants to very badly indeed and another part of us doesn't and can't. We get stuck. Being stuck is something that happens to so many of us in the Christian life. And at, at that point, the devil weighs in and he accuses us. It's his job. He accuses us and he brings despair. And the only antidote to this accusation that follows our getting stuck is Jesus himself. But we have to understand who he is and what he has done for us. The great, one of the great heresies in the church has always been something called Arianism. Arius saw Jesus 
as something less than the second person of the Trinity, something less than the Logos, begotten, not created for, before the beginning of time. And the problem with this something less than Jesus is that he can't do things for us. He is an example we follow. He teaches us. He shows us the way. We follow him. But when we get stuck and when we get accused, there seems no remedy. And so Jesus comes to baptism because we have to stand at the side of the river. We have to be baptised and repent and be forgiven. And very often this is something we can't manage for ourselves. Something pulls back. Something doesn't consent. We fall short. And only insofar as we are in Jesus does it happen at all. So Jesus stands for us when he gets baptised by John. He is not being baptised for himself, for he is sinless. He's getting baptised for us. He shows us this is the way, this is what needs to happen. And if there comes a point when we can't manage, he does it for us on our behalf. St Paul had this very profound understanding of being stuck and being two men, one of whom consented to Jesus with great joy, but the other of whom rejected and rebelled. And St Paul quite wonderfully explains this stuckness that we all fall into. He says, when I want to do good, when I want to follow Christ most closely, evil is at hand and I, I find I can't. The things I want to do, I, I, I don't end up by being able to do. And the things I really don't want to do, I end up by doing. This raises very important questions about who the I is. And he goes on to talk about the old man and the new man. Paul has a very developed understanding of a relationship with Jesus in which the bit which is left up to him falls short and the bit that's given over to Jesus succeeds is probably the wrong word, but the bit that's given over to Jesus is changed. And here again, this goes right to the heart of our being forgiven. Very often we find we can't forgive ourselves because the voice of accusation is loud within us. We feel very strongly we don't deserve it. And only at that point can we experience forgiven if we have given ourselves over to Jesus and then it is for him to forgive us. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's not that the world manages to push away its sins or cover them up or, or deal with them in some kind of way. It is Jesus, the Lamb, who takes away our sins and the proper relationship to, to be in with Jesus is complete abandonment. We only come to him when we say, Lord, I can't manage this. I have failed so badly. And at that point, like the shepherd picking up the lost sheep who is lame and lost, he carries us home. It's this being in Christ, this part of Christ who does everything for us. This is what turns us from being a religious person inspired by Jesus into being an in Christ person, a Christian, someone who's in Christ. I think for myself this is one of the hardest lessons to learn as a Christian. It's, it's, it's very profound and yet it's one of the deepest things and the deepest discoveries that we need to come across. And it all begins with Jesus being baptised, not because he needed to, but because he calls us to this constant repentance. And it's when we fall on our knees, knees and say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner, that we know this forgiveness. It's when we say, Lord, I have failed dreadfully, that we discover what his forgiveness really means. And we find this all the way through the Gospels. It's quite a dangerous idea because it suggests that we can go on sinning and go on being forgiven. So Paul at one point tries to explore the implications of this and he says quite rightly, it doesn't mean you can go on sinning because you know you're going to get a free pass. It means you can go on sinning because you're human. But if you truly are wounded by it and repent of it, and hate it, you can be forgiven.
time after time after time. This is why St. Peter has to forgive his enemy seven times seven without limit because there's no limit to our forgiveness either. We forgive as we are forgiven. Is there a limit to the number of times we can ask Jesus to come to our aid because we've fallen flat on our faces again? No, there is no limit. And so we cannot put limits on our own forgiveness of others because we give what has been given to us. It, it, it overflows. So the baptism of Christ is inviting us to learn about our two natures and not to despair about the one that doesn't perform, the one that is a hypocrite, the one that gives up, the one that gets stuck, the one that other people might laugh at and, uh, and look down on as we do ourselves. Because we have another nature. And it is the nature of having become, being in Christ. Behold, when anyone is in Christ, they are a new person. The old has gone. It has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's this newness that we practice living in. Living in this newness of Christ is such an important element and it's one of the things in church that we need to help each other with. In other words, when someone is in Christ, we don't see them as they were. We see them as if they were with Jesus. I remember one of my very earliest Christian experiences came when I was a second year law student and there was somebody I intensely disliked. I disliked him so much that I tried to avoid him whenever I saw him. And uh, I have no idea what the reason was. It may have been just a piece of personal chemistry. Who knows? It doesn't matter. One day, I was turned into a long corridor. And just as I turned in at the other end, this person I disliked also turned in. And I thought, oh, no, it's him. If I turn round, if I look at my watch and turn round quickly on my heels, I can disappear the other way and we won't, I won't have to pass him and be uncomfortable <clears throat> in this, this long corridor. And as I was thinking about this, I looked up and it's really quite hard to explain, but it seemed to me that he was suddenly accompanied by somebody in white and I knew it was Jesus and I couldn't look at him. I couldn't look clearly at Jesus. I didn't dare. It was like out of the corner of my eye. I just knew. And I didn't think, how did that happen? Am I really seeing him? Is it really Jesus? I just knew. And I suddenly realised that if I turned on my heel and turned on my back on this man I found profoundly uncomfortable, I would also be turning my back on Jesus. And so I didn't. I continued to walk, eyes slightly cast down, and we passed each other with a small nod of acknowledgement. We need to look at other members of the Christian body as if they have Jesus next to them with his arm round them. We need to treat each other as if we were perpetually accompanied, each of us, by the risen Christ. What we do for one another, we do for him. We need to help each other learn what it is to be in Christ so we see ourselves as someone new rather than someone old. The great failure, one of the great failures of the church is that we have simply smeared a religious patina on the whole business of being a human being and on one another, kept all the old social structures, kept the prejudices rather than discovering that we are here to help each other to learn what it is to be in Christ. But first of all, we shouldn't be alarmed or astonished about this division of ourselves into the old person and the new person. There was a vicar of St Martin in the field called Austin Williams who wrote a very moving prayer and meditation, which I love and use very often. Lord, I am two men. And one is longing to serve thee utterly, and one is afraid. O oh Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, I am two men. One will labour to the end, and one is already weary. O oh Lord, have mercy upon me. For I am two men. 
and one knows the suffering of the world and one knows only his own. O Lord, have mercy upon me. And may the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ fill my heart and the hearts of all men everywhere. Austin Williams In the end, our prayer is the prayer of the thief on the cross who looks at Jesus and simply says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And our Lord looks at our faith and not our crimes. He looks at our longing and not our failure. For he sees that we have been forgiven by his sacrifice, by his blood. For he is the lamb who carries and takes away the sins of the world. And it is for this reason that as Christians we are profoundly grateful. And for this reason that our Jesus needs to be God incarnate. For only God incarnate can take away the sins of the world. Only God himself can pay the price. The Aryan Jesus, the Jesus who is less than fully God. The Muslim Jesus, the liberals Jesus, the Jesus of the rationalists who can't accept something they're unable to get their minds around. This Jesus will never save us. But the real Jesus has saved us through and through. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>